Pulse on Creative podcast, where we hear from creative experts, influencers, dreamers, and doers, what they've learned and what we can learn from their journey as we explore, respond, and create. Well, hey there, and welcome back to a new season of the Hillsong Creative Podcast. This is Rich Langton, I'm your host, and I'm so glad that you've joined us. We've been on a season break, but during the break, we've had a couple of uh, bonus episodes, and they were seemingly really well received. So if you haven't heard those, go back and check them out. And uh, the one I really love was the episode with Taya and JD. We uh, introduced the buzzer, um, which was cool, a lot of fun, talked about Hillsong United, and uh, and answered some questions around leading worship, around set lists around the practicalities of touring and life and all that stuff. It was a good one. Um, but for those of you who've been around for a long time, I'd like to thank you as well for joining us on the journey. You guys have been great at giving us feedback and letting us know what you'd love to hear on the podcast, who you'd love to hear from. There's been some really fantastic uh, reviews on iTunes and I've, I've so appreciate getting that feedback and really knowing what's, uh, what's resonating with you. So if you've been a long time listener and you'd love to help us out, it'd be great if you could go give us a review on iTunes. Uh, it helps the podcast to be visible. It helps people to know what the podcast's about and how helpful it is. And um, it helps us to know the direction we, we can take and what really resonates with you guys. So thanks for doing that. And uh, this season's going to be fantastic. We've got a whole bunch of um, amazing guests lined up and a whole lot of topics that we're going to explore that I think you'll find really helpful. So buckle up and get ready for the new season. It's going to be fantastic. And so we're going to kick off today's episode with a really good interview. I had the privilege of speaking with Erwin McManus uh, at our colour conference just a few short weeks ago. Cass and I have gotten to know Erwin over the last few years and he is someone who's both inspiring and challenging. I think you'll find as you listen that he can't help but challenge our, um, our mindset. He's so creative, so forward thinking and, um, and, and is someone that I really look up to in many ways. So I hope as you listen, you listen with an open heart and a creative mind and that you can hear how he's challenging you as a creative to move forward and to not be limited by the circumstances you find yourself in. So we're going to jump straight into it and I hope you enjoy it. Erwin, welcome. I guess I'm privileged to be able to interview tonight and chat to you about all things creativity. Cass and I have known of you for a long time, but have only, I guess you've only come into our, you know, immediate world the last couple of years. Yeah, you guys are amazing. I, I love doing this with you. When you know someone from a distance and then you meet them face to face. It's really disappointing, isn't it? Well, you have a different perspective <laughs> for sure. And so, like, for example, if anyone, I, I've got your Wikipedia page here. Oh, if anyone was that. to, um, <laughs> you know, know of you, they would, they would go, you know, go to Wikipedia and it would say, Owen Raphael McManus, mm-hmm. he's an author, mystic, futurist, filmmaker and designer. And he's the lead pastor of Mosaic, an emerging church in Los Angeles, California. I read that. And having read some of your books, having met you, mm-hmm. having watched you speak, and then I wonder, who does Erwin think Erwin is? I think I'm Kim's husband. Yeah. And I'm Aaron and Mariah's and Patty's dad. And everything else fluctuates in life, but mm-hmm. those things remain constant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I guess I ask the question because, you know, from a distance, you, you seem to be doing so much. Whatever you see from a distance... It's actually just a microcosm of what I'm actually doing. Right. Because the things that I'm doing that are most important to me and are, and are most affecting the future, I don't let anybody know. Mm-hmm. And so those things, um, nobody on Wikipedia would be able to find out. Right. Yeah, so there's a lot of projects. I'm, I'm always working on something. And, mm-hmm. and, I, and I actually try to help people understand how to take um, your hobbies, your interests, and turn them into your life and your career. Mm. Every 10 years of my life, I changed careers. Right. Um, and I usually had about a four-year process that where I was underground creating my next future. Many times where my wife felt really confused because I'd say, hey, can I, it's okay if I decide to spend the next 20 years creating art. And she says, sure, go ahead. And then when I had a fashion company, and a film company, she goes, hey, what are you doing? I said, we talked about this. She, she goes, yeah, but I didn't think you could do this. And right. If I'm anything, I think I'm a really like hard worker and, mm. I, and I'm, I'm a voracious learner. Mm. So I, I, I never think to myself, oh, I'm, I'm not good enough to do this. I go, I know I'm not good enough to do this. Right. But I know that I can learn how to be good at this mm. if I put intention and, 
and, uh, and passion behind it. Mm-hmm. So it's always fun, you know, to one day not be a designer and then to have fashion lines and one day not be a filmmaker and then to be working on commercials and films and right. one day not be a writer and then be a writer. And yeah, I have dreams all the, I mean, right now I have some real significant plans for my seventies, which would be 10 to 15 years from now. Right. But I've had those plans for at least 10 years. <laughs> and so I'm giving myself ramp, ramp up time because if you want to be average at something, then do it fast. Yeah. If you want to be great at something, then give yourself a long, a long tail to, mm. to really develop the skills and competencies. Yeah. yeah. So then why, why every four or five years change? Because I change. Right. Because I keep growing as a human being because mm-hmm. I don't stay the same. I remember years ago, my brother said to me, and I did, he didn't mean it as a compliment. He said, wow, you've really changed. And I was insulted. And then mm. I realized, oh, I have. And I'll keep changing. And now I take it as the greatest compliment of my life. Mm. I mean, even when you think about like for church life or ministry, mm. like most of the pastors my age are more reflective of the last generation. Mm-hmm. And then their sons and their kids and their young leaders are more ge- reflective of this present generation. Right. And the reality is like mosaic is really not reflective of this generation or the last generation. It's actually more reflective of the next generation. Because mm. yeah, uh, mosaic isn't a church that um, reflects LA. Mosaic is a church that reflects the future. Mm. And that's our commitment. Mm. And I think it's true in everything. And so if you're always doing that, you're always gonna be growing and evolving and changing. And mm. and um, yeah, so, you know, I, I have so many things that I have not yet had the courage to do. Yeah. And so as I grow as a human being, hopefully mm. I'll do more of them. Did you think life would look like it does 20, 30, 40 years ago? No. Did you have any <laughs> idea what the future would hold? Yes. Because you planned for it, worked towards it, or, or how did you know? Well, I, one, I worked as a futurist for like 30 years of my life. Right. And uh, so a huge part of my, uh, my job was actually to look at trends and movements and to project where culture is going. Mm. Um, but I also knew that the future is created by those who are the most courageous or intentional. Mm-hmm. You know, so I never thought of the future as some ethereal thing that happens to us. Right. I, I thought of the future as something that's waiting, it's malleable and waiting for someone with courage and creativity and intention. And so I thought I can, I can do that. I can create a future, you mm-hmm. know, and, and maybe I can create a big enough future, not just for me, but for other people as well. Mm. And so I, I, but the reason I, I would say I'd never imagined this future is because one, I was never considered a very talented person. Mm-hmm. You know, I was never the person chosen or picked or, you know, I was not um, LeBron James or right. Kobe Bryant or Michael Jordan. So I, I didn't know that there would be a day where people actually thought it was good at something. Mm. <laughs> that, right. that surprises me right. to this day. <laughs> you know, I'm still pretty shocked. So then you work as a futurist, life changes because you're aiming to change it. But then there's this, this sort of, um, I guess, fear that can grip us all mm-hmm. that might stop you from walking into that. Has that, has that been an ongoing hurdle? No, I think people who are afraid usually have a higher view of themselves. And so their high view of themselves paralyzes them from risking. Hmm. I had a very low view of myself, so I wasn't afraid of failing. I okay. feel like, of course I'm gonna fail. You know, it's not a big deal. Okay. And, and so I, actually I've even done psychological like research on this and uh, people who, see themselves as more talented than other people mm. usually are, are more fragile hmm. and less resilient. And people who think that their only advantage is working hard because they're less talented, they actually are more resilient. Mm-hmm. So ironically, I, um, I've just never felt like my limitation of talents or whatever you know, I didn't have would stop me from creating the life I wanted mm. or creating the world that I long for and mm. outwork people and outguts them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that that view of yourself came from your childhood, or is that is that because we're all sinners and you no, know, yeah, it's funny. religious thing? My or? mom actually told me one day. This was not that long ago. She said, "Honey, I'm so sorry. My father told me, tell him he's nothing. <laughs> no way. <laughs> tell him he has no talent, no ability. He has no future. He'll never uh, rise up to be anything. And then he'll hate you, and he'll live his whole life to prove you wrong." Uh, she was right. It worked. <laughs> you know. So I, I grew up being told I wasn't, that I wasn't much, mm. you know? And so I had a, a really low sense of self. Mm. But then again, I thought, I, I came to a place in my life where I thought, no one's gonna choose me. Mm-hmm. So I gotta like, I gotta pick myself. And then when I, you know, crashed into Jesus, I'm like, wow, you're like, 
he's choosing me. I'm not just like his backup plan. You know, e even like this um, event, which has been wonderful. I wasn't the first choice. I mm -hmm. was invited. I was asked to come and help him in a situation, and I had just told a bunch of people the week before. I've always been people's plan B, mm -hmm. but I've accepted the fact that I'm God's plan A. Right. And um, other people I, just didn't know that. They just yet. don't know. Right. You know, <laughs> I went at the, at the age of 29. I went from speaking to 50 people to 20,000 in 45 minutes. Wow. Yeah, because I was working backstage at an event and the speaker didn't show up. And there were like 20 guys wearing suits waiting to, to preach. And I, it hadn't even occurred to me. Mm. I wouldn't even go that night. My wife made me go to help. And the guy in charge came up to me and I'm just wearing, you know, blue jeans, tennis shoes and a t-shirt. All these guys are all in suits. And the guy goes, I think you're supposed to preach tonight. And I don't think I've ever spoken to more than 50 people in my whole life. And this is where the Dallas Mavericks play basketball. It's 20,000 people crammed mm -hmm. in that stadium. I went to a little room, fell on my face, wept uncontrollably from absolute fear and terror. And then I said, hey, could you get, find me a Bible? Because I didn't even have a Bible or anything. Right, you weren't ready. You know, yeah. and then I just went up there <laughs> and that kind of opened up a whole world for me. Mm. And then I was constantly being invited to places where the speaker didn't show up. <laughs> and even like the Global Leadership Summit that has like mm -hmm. a half a million people, mm -hmm. yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, I got a phone call, I think like at three or two in the morning, four in the morning from Jimmy Otta saying, hey, the speaker isn't showing up at 9 a.m. We heard mm -hmm. you're here. Mm -hmm. And would you would you speak? And uh, I said, uh, sure, you know. Yeah. And uh, then I hung up and I said, hey, honey, did someone just ask me to speak today at you know the summit? She goes, well, was there anybody on the other side of the phone? I said, yeah, I think so. So I was like so tired, I didn't even, wasn't even sure. Hmm. And I uh, went over there and you know spoke at the summit and, hmm. and um, that's where the message of the barbarian way came out. So I, I think a lot of it is, I, I postured my heart to say, I'll never be, I'll never be too self-important hmm. to be a replacement. Mm -hmm. And I want to be known around the world as the guy on zero notice can bring an A game. So when people say we're well, honored to have you, I go, you're not. You're just relieved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone came to speak. Yeah. If you're yeah. honored, you would have asked me. Right, right, right. You're just relieved. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll well, take that. I'm okay with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. My life has been really beautiful because uh -huh. of bringing relief to a lot of right. people. It's but, pretty great. Yeah, I love that. When did you sort of start thinking uh, about create creativity or with imagination, as in you, obviously you, you've always done that, but when did you start thinking about the fact that you do that? Yeah, that's <laughs> a that great, that's sense? a really good question, I, I think. And I don't know fully, mm. you, you know, mm -hmm. we always try to reconstruct history yeah. to try to figure things out, right. you know. The first book that I remember identifying myself with mm. was um, a book by a guy named Robert Heinlein called Glory Road. And I used to give that book away to people and tell them this book will change your life. Like before I knew about Jesus and the Bible, okay. you know, that was like my Bible. And, and um, that book has all kinds of fascinating views of reality and mm -hmm. multi, you know, multiverses and mm -hmm. um, multidimensional realities. And, mm -hmm. and I remember there was like this um, immortal giant that has to be defeated to be able to get to the next part of the journey. And right. how do you kill an unkillable giant. Mm. And Scar, the main character, puts the giant's foot in his mouth and then puts the other foot in his mouth and then starts pushing the legs into the giant's mouth and rolls the giant's body into his mouth until <laughs> the giant disappears and eats himself. Right. And I bring this up because we, I read that when I was 10 mm. and I thought there are infinite possibilities that have never been perceived. Mm -hmm. And so it postured my whole life mm. toward always asking the question, what, what are we not seeing, mm. you know? And then I became a person of faith and I was told really discipleship was about conformity. Mm. Discipleship was about standardization and spirituality and spiritual maturity was about looking like everyone else. Mm. And that was really, really disturbing to me. Mm. You know, because from my perspective, everybody looked like Ken and Barbie. <laughs> you know, I mean, Christians just, they uh, thought there's a doll made mm. by you. <laughs> and uh, right. and I didn't fit into that world at all. Mm. So I spent about 10 years working with drug cartels and urban poor and gangs. And, and so creativity wasn't a, um, a luxury. Mm. It was a necessity. Mm -hmm. I had to find creative ways to engage into worlds that would normally have killed me the first day I walked into their doors. And right. 
and um, and I had to find unique ways of communicating the message of Jesus and mm. and uh, ways of adapting what the church looked like. So I was doing it, but I wasn't thinking about creativity, mm-hmm. which is really what your question is, right? right? You, you know, and um, and I realized that people who had third grade educations had incredibly high memorization skills because they can't read, mm. and so people who are illiterate have a higher capacity to memorize than people who are literate. Right. Because you don't have to remember anything. You can read everything. But Mm -hmm. if you're literate, you have to memorize all the science and everything else. And so I realized that like things like theater and film was really a great way for them to learn because of their high memorization skills because now they have a distinct advantage. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that's where like the arts, like for me, the arts were not a suburban expression of, isn't this nice? Right. (laughs) You know, I was working with assassins and, gang leaders and mm. prostitutes and people in drug cartels and helping them find new outlets for their imagination and creativity. Mm, mm. So it was very different in that sense. But when I went to LA, <clears throat> before that, I um, I think I was probably 24. I drove through LA and I had this epiphany about Los Angeles and I found a letter that was written by Karl Marx mm. that said, send me everything you can about Los Angeles for it is the future of capitalism. And I thought Karl Marx had a really uncanny ability to understand global movements. And, mm. and I thought, no, it's not the future of capitalism, it's the future of humanity. Mm. And it's the epicenter of human creativity. Mm. So I did kind of a global assessment and I decided Los Angeles was the capital of the future. That's why I moved there. Wow. So that if I can live one place to impact the future of humanity most powerfully, it would, it would be there. Mm. It's like the fountainhead. Mm-hmm. And so I think I went to LA thinking that creativity was the commodity of the future. Mm. And I remember early on, like when I was probably 30 years old saying, you know, that um, the future economy is creativity and mm. Los Angeles inhales the world, can exhale the gospel. And and um, and I put five core values together when I started Mosaic. And the fifth core value is creativity is the natural result of spirituality. And frankly, no one agreed with me. Like I actually was seen as a heretic because of that statement. Mm-hmm. Now it just seems so normal. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I had a lot of people who vehemently like opposed that mm-hmm. declaration. And I decided that I would just violate everybody I knew and stand in that space, even though I, did, I had no one who agreed with me. Mm-hmm. And, and then I found this ancient Russian philosopher, uh, Nicholas Berdyaev. He wrote about creativity in the spiritual act. Mm. I found this obscure quote and I tracked it down and Mm. I found this out of print book by this guy from the times about Saint or Nicholas the Great. And and I had my office, I said, okay, track down every copy of this book in the world and buy it. Wow. And by buying all that, all the copies of the book that existed, I helped the book come back into print. (laughs) And which was one of my goals. Yeah. Because I, I, I told my wife, I said, here's someone who lived in another time mm. who I never met, mm. who sees creativity and spirituality the same way. Mm. And it was somehow um, incredibly um, hopeful to me. Yeah. yeah. Someone who understood what you saw. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. What made you keep, keep pursuing that way of thinking? Because I felt like the church would die if it didn't change its mind about creativity. I felt like what happened was the, the enlightenment which of course was you know, a good thing. Mm. Um, it's, it's better to move towards science than, than superstition. Right. Mm-hmm. 100%. <laughs> you know? and, uh, uh, the Enlightenment had a spiritual, and, but the Renaissance didn't have a spiritual reaction. Mm. And so what happened was the Enlightenment democratized and said, everyone can think, I think therefore I am. And the Reformation democratized and said, everyone can have a personal relationship with Jesus. Mm-hmm. The Renaissance stayed Catholic. And so it stayed among the cultural elite. Mm. So there was Raphael and Michelangelo. And, and, and so it saw creativity as a distinct expression of a small group of people. Mm. And I felt like what I was doing was I was reclaiming what was lost in the Renaissance and creating a, a new Renaissance. So um, if the church had had a, a parallel movement like the Reformation, mm. Mosaic would have existed 500 years ago because it would have seen creativity as a spiritual expression. Mm. And that there was no no conflict between spirituality and creativity. Mm. In fact, I'm on the phone in church, and I heard family favor, and I said, "Judah, anything you need for your family, I'm in." Mm. I didn't know he needed me to speak at an event right. <laughs> that Friday, <laughs> and uh, so I find myself on a plane flying to his great place, and uh, in Northern California, 
And the pastor, after we had time, his kids like read my books and listened to our podcast. And we were having a real honest conversation. He goes, hey, why do you think like my generation all thought you were an outlier and, and felt you were a heretic? Mm. And I would include President Company mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, as a movement. I don't usually respond like this, it's because you're wrong. Mm. And, I kick, and I pulled you in the future kicking and screaming. I said, the only reason you're even comfortably being here is because your kids read my books and didn't give up on the church. Mm. But the church did not want to step into the future. Mm. I mean, what was crazy to me when I worked as a futurist is I'd go to, I work with companies and they maybe would be five, 10 years behind mm. culture. But with the church, the church would be 500 years behind right. or 50 years behind. Mm. And they called contemporary music, music that was played in the 60s. And I'm going, this isn't contemporary music. This, sure. this music is 50 years old. Mm. Contemporary churches were churches that just were not as old, mm. you, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think a part of the evolution of it is that there were a lot of great churches that were traditional. Mm. And they were exactly what they're supposed to be because they were in their time and space. Right. But the world changed and they didn't change because mm. they uh, assumed that methodology was theology. Mm-hmm. And then the church became contemporary, mm. you know, and out of the, it's, Authenticity was actually traditional, but its desperation was contemporary. Mm-hmm. And then went from contemporary to trying to be more creative and start creating things that, that could uh, affect culture and define art. And, but the authenticity took time to catch up mm-hmm. because really the leaders were actually more inherently traditional. Mm-hmm. And I think what's happening now is that the authenticity, because traditional churches were not inauthentic. Mm. They were just irrelevant, <laughs> right. you know? Mm. And uh, they're different things. And I think sometimes we mistake that. Mm. Like my grandmother, she wasn't fashionable, but she was authentic. Right. And I think what's happening now is that the church is realizing, okay, breaking f- free from tradition and breaking free from being contemporary and breaking free into creativity is a beautiful thing, but we left authenticity behind. Sure. Mm. And it's really important for creativity and authenticity to intermix, mm. Mm. you know? So it's not just, cause I never sat around and said, how do I make Mosaic the most creative like church in the world? Mm. I sat around and said, I have friends that I love and I gotta figure out how to reach them. Mm. And I, I find that creativity becomes superficial when the intention is wrong, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. Communication is a multi-dynamic process. Mm. Like even like my pants, the ones I wore on stage right. and everything like that, you know, and preachers think they're only communicating with their words. Mm-hmm. But I know that there's someone that's gonna be watching Hillsong that the pants actually connect to the frequency of who they are. Oh, yeah. And that allows the music mm. that I am trying to transmit to mm-hmm. actually get into their soul. Mm-hmm. And so I see everything as a part of the story mm. that I'm telling. Yeah. And then this journalist asked me, well, how, why would a pastor be into fashion? Right. I said, oh, it's because I didn't grow up in church. Because <laughs> 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 only people who grew up in church are told that fashion is evil. Right. Pastors are supposed to look irrelevant. Mm-hmm. You know, I said, you're just mad because I'm not irrelevant. Right. And, and I said, I don't look weird. Mm. I look like the guy who doesn't go to church. Mm. But I just did a podcast with a guy named Lewis Howe. Mm-hmm. And he's, he has something called the School of Greatness. Yeah, and I get like some notes from people going, "Hey, he's an atheist. He's not, you know." But that's the posture that they told me, like he's not open or anything like that. Yeah, and we had the best time. Mm-hmm. And right before it we went live, he said, "Is there anything I could do to make this interview better?" And I said, "Yeah, let's just have an authentic conversation between you and me, and let's let people listen in." Sure. We had this ninety-minute conversation. It's all about faith and God and spirituality. I don't know if any mm-hmm. of you guys heard it, and you could just feel it was just this beautiful connecting moment. Mm. And a huge part for me is that Lewis is not a project for me. I actually really like him. Right. You know, and mm-hmm. I think a part of it was that as he got to know me, I wasn't a project to him and mm. he started liking me. And mm. you're always in danger when you like someone that's different than you. <laughs> you're gonna change. Mm. And he sends me a text that night going, hey, we just keep talking about the podcast and we can't stop talking about it all day. And, mm. The next day my book came out, The mm-hmm. Way of the Warrior. And he goes, we're gonna blow up your book. We're gonna, and he just started marketing wow. The Way of the Warrior everywhere. Mm-hmm. And he has 2 million followers. And he's just telling them, yeah. you know, you listen to this podcast, buy this book. I'm mm-hmm. going, I've got this guy mm-hmm. who everyone says doesn't believe, mm-hmm. who believes in me, right? you know, and he's uh, being a better friend to me than a lot of people <laughs> I've ever known. And then he 
texts me on Sunday afternoon. He goes, I'm flying back from Mexico City. I want to come visit Mosaic. Mm. Had not been in church his whole adult life, I think. Right. And comes to Mosaic and he's right there with us. And, mm. and then I invite him to the basketball game. He comes hanged and he comes back to church the next Sunday. Mm. And he goes, okay, what are your two big dreams? And I tell him, you know, my two big dreams right now. And he goes, how can I help? Amazing. Mm. And I think this is the thing is that we're the ones who draw the lines between people who believe and people who don't believe. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're oftentimes the ones who think that those lines are insurmountable. And a lot of my friends don't believe. Mm. I mean, a lot of my friends are atheists or agnostics and, and a lot of my friends used to be, mm. but they're not anymore. Mm. And I just really just enjoy people who disagree with me. <laughs> I enjoy people who see the world differently. And I see them as my like seeing eye humans. I mm. just go, teach me how you see the world. Mm. And I think a lot of times Christians don't think they can learn from people who don't believe like them. Mm. I think a lot of pastors, they need a seeing eye human. Mm. They need to go to a, an atheist and say, hey, I'm irrelevant. <laughs> right. I don't even know how to talk to a, a real human being. Could you have lunch with me once a week? Mm. And I'll try to talk to you about God. And you tell me everywhere I don't make sense. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, imagine how that would change you. Yeah. Right? Do you think that's because people are afraid? Of course, yeah, yeah. It's it's because we're afraid that we're wrong. Right. And, because and will it, be proven wrong? Yeah, or? because what happens if they ask the question that you can't answer mm -hmm. or the question that you can't answer, not for them, but for yourself, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so I, to me, it's like a whole thing's really loosely, mm -hmm. you know? I just did this uh, Christian radio show in, in uh, New York. And it's funny, everything I did that was secular went really, really well. <laughs> and, uh, and then I had this moment in the Christian interview where they said, well, how do you make sure you protect orthodoxy while pursuing relevance? I said, you're not gonna like my answer. I said, I have no interest in protecting orthodoxy. I'd blow it up. Hmm. He goes, what? He goes, he goes, why would you do that? And I said, because I don't care about protecting orthodoxy. I only care about pursuing truth. Mm -hmm. He goes, well, what do you mean? How are they different? Orthodoxy was the world is flat. And if you disagree with us, we're gonna kill you. <laughs> I set you on fire. Orthodoxy is that the sun revolves around the earth. Mm. Orthodoxy is the Supreme Court of Tennessee in the 1800s saying that women did not have the right to vote because they did not have souls. Hmm. I said, I think that was wrong too. Hmm. And see that, all that's orthodoxy. And if you pursue truth, you will be a heretic hmm. because we don't hold the market on truth. Hmm. We have a lot of things we hold on to that are superstitious. Hmm. Even the way, can we go with theology a little bit? Hmm. Yes. Like even the way, <laughs> like you talk about the devil, and like, when I hear Christians talk about the devil, I'm like, what devil are you talking about? Mm. Cause you're not talking about the devil in the Bible. Mm. Cause I don't know if you noticed this, but we have given the devil a promotion and an upgrade. Mm. We treat the devil like he's the brother of God. Mm. And most of us are not actually biblical thinkers. We're like Greek or Roman or North yeah. mythology. Yeah, yeah. We actually think that they're parallel gods. Mm. See the devil, and I believe Satan exists. Mm. So just to clarify that. Right. Okay. So a little bit orthodox. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> no completely wrong because you can use the same name and, and have the, um, the, the wrong understanding, right? Because if you say God, but you don't believe God is holy, mm. then, you, then it's not God. Right. Right? Yep. So when you say the devil and you treat the devil as if he's all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-present, mm. aren't you talking about an evil God? Sure not the Satan that the scriptures talk about. Mm. So I look at it and go, okay, Satan is an angel, mm. fallen angel. Sure. So Satan is not all present. Mm. So if he's bothering you and I'm okay with that, he can't bother me because he's not all present. Right. And I'm like, most people, I'm like, that one, the devil, that's just you being stupid. Yeah. Devil is not all present, devil's not all powerful, mm. and devil's not all knowing. Mm. So when we think the devil knows everything, the devil doesn't know in my mind, mm. and only God can invade my mind in this way. Mm. The devil can whisper, or spirits can whisper. And, and I do believe in demonic forces. I do believe in spirits. Mm. So, but I, I just think I believe in them in the way this, the Bible talks about them. Mm. And so when I hear people talk about the devil, I'm going, you are treating the devil as if he is the equal of God. Mm. That is not a biblical concept. Right. That's, not, that's orthodox, but mm. it's not biblical. Right. We'll get right back to the episode, brought to you by our Hillsong Worship and Creative Conference, which happens in Sydney, Australia. It's for every kind of creative, whether you're a musician, singer, a graphic designer, architect, an audio engineer, or video editor. 
It's a place for the artists of the church to gather together, to worship, to be inspired and refreshed, and to be equipped and trained for your sphere of creativity. Find out more details at hillsong.com forward slash WCC. Now, let's get back to the episode. I'm Erwin McManus, and this is my Fantastic Four. What my favorite cuisine is, is very difficult because I love great cuisine. And um, so it's not really about a particular culture or style. I can't say Chinese or I can't say um, Japanese or sushi or steak because bad sushi or average sushi would not be my favorite. But world-class sushi would be my favorite. You know, if I'm eating world-class Chinese, that would be my favorite. So I would say I care less about what kind it is than I care about the quality of it. I didn't have to sleep, I would probably live kind of like the way I, I live. I don't sleep very much. You can ask my wife, my, my sleep patterns are really short. And so I think in terms of catching up over a month or something like that, you know, and so it's easy for me to go two or three days without sleeping at all. And I know it's incredibly unhealthy and I don't recommend it to anyone, but I'm 60 and it's really hard to break this life pattern. I, what I love about sleeping is dreaming. And I have a, a hyper vivid imagination, so my dreams keep on after I wake up, sometimes dramatically so where my wife and my family has to bring me down because I don't know that I'm um, awake and walking to the house and in the middle of a dream. And uh, so uh, I feel like sleeping is wonderful when you're able to dream about a future and creating something that doesn't exist. Yeah. I think I would be terrible at any job I did not have a passion for. And I think any job that I saw its meaning and its value, I could figure out how to be good at. You know, so I, I've worked as a, I mean, I worked as a landscaper and found out that I would get paid more for designing their garden areas and we would get paid for mowing their lawns. And so I found a way of creating something really beautiful and artistic as a landscaper. And, you know, whether I worked as a lumberjack or worked as a carpenter or worked in construction, I always found some way to bring some level or measure of creativity into it. All right, so let's take this back to creativity because this is what your podcast is about. Sure. Creativity has this amazing way. It's like a love. Mm. If you love someone, you'll actually change your behavior without realizing you've changed your mind. And uh, just like simple things, you know, like uh, my wife finally loves oysters. <laughs> it took me 35, 33 years to get them to try them. Mm. But eventually, because she loved me, she just kept trying them until right. one day she realized she loved them, mm. right? And there are things that, you know, I, I've watched Pride and Prejudice, oh, maybe 6,000 times. <laughs> <laughs> you know, who knows? Because my wife loves Pride and Prejudice. Mm. And I'll sit there with her and I'll watch it over and over again. Mm. If I didn't love her, I probably wouldn't love that movie as much, even right. although I do think it's phenomenal. And... Love has an amazing way of changing who you are without you actually perceiving you've changed your mind. Mm. I think creativity has that power, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons I think people are afraid of it. Creativity has the ability to change the way you relate to reality without you even realizing it's happened. Mm. By the way, nothing shapes theology like worship. Mm. And like one of the practical things I see in the States is one of the huge movements in America connected to worship is a very Calvinistic uh, movement. Mm. And so an entire generation of America's youth are incredibly reformed, very Calvinistic, which Hillsong is not. Mm -hmm. But Hillsong's music has been readily accepted by the same people who love like Passion's music. Yep. And so you have a continuity mm. between Hillsong and Passion, mm. even though you have completely opposite views of the sovereignty of God. Right. And it's and I look at it and go, all the messages I could ever preach won't change as many people's minds as your songs will. Mm. Because people embrace theology through worship. Yeah. And they don't even know it. 100%. It's like love. Mm. It changes your mind without you even realizing it. Right. And, and that's one of the things I think you guys have done so beautifully. Mm. And so when I started Mosaic, you know, I mean, 30 years ago, I had people painting throughout the auditorium, mm. not on stage. Mm. I mean, literally there'd be a fourth seat. There was a person painting. I would create easels and put them throughout the whole auditorium. And right. we had built installations inside the building and mm. changed the 
interior design of the building week mm -hmm. to week to week mm -hmm. and move the stage into different parts of the building mm -hmm. so people would know if we were in the middle, on the side, in front. <laughs> and uh, we used stand-up comedy 30 years ago mm -hmm. and, you know, and uh, sketch comedy and, you know, film. I was editing films and using them in the middle of my talks. And mm -hmm. I grew up watching Rod Sterling's Night Gallery and The Twilight Zone. And right. so I designed my messages like the night gallery where I would walk in and talk for four or five minutes and there'd be an artistic experience and I'd walk through it. And, and then um, there'd be another artistic experience. It'd be three or four experiences in the middle of my conversation. Hmm. And that's why I would go to churches and they'd go, hey, right before you, there's a creative piece. And then there's your message. I'm going, well, my message is a creative piece. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, which is one of the things why uh, I would never allow spoken word before my message. Hmm. And people go, wait a minute, we have a spoken word right before you speak. And I said, <laughs> I'm going to speak. <laughs> I'm actually doing spoken word. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, but this is art. I said, yeah, what I'm doing is art. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not doing art, then I need to quit. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is like when I'm speaking, I consider that an art form. Mm -hmm. The words actually matter to me. Mm -hmm. And the same way when I'm writing a book, there's a cadence. Mm -hmm. Like I've had sat down with my editors and said, if you can't hear the music in my writing, you can't edit my books. Mm -hmm because this sentence has to have seven words mm -hmm. and this sentence has to have six words. And this is a four, three, four sentence. This mm -hmm. is this word has four letters, this word has three letters, this word has four letters. Mm -hmm. And they think I'm out of my mind, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm OCD to the detail <laughs> and the writing has, is art. Mm -hmm. And what I realize is that what people underestimate is the power of creativity mm -hmm. to change not only a person's mind about an idea, but to change the way the person sees reality. Mm. The reason we did all that and we did dance and everything else is because, and we started having dancers come from everywhere and painters and artists and designers. And, and we, we would do the largest fashion show in LA. We had over a thousand people at our last fashion show. This is 20 mm. years ago. Mm -hmm. This is before this stuff was fashionable. Mm. And we did that because we wanted to, to tear <laughs> the veil down between creativity and spirituality. Mm. And, and some of it was really bad. Mm. <laughs> you know? But what we were saying is like, we're going to figure this thing out. We're going to be this creative expression of who Jesus is and how could we ever do anything that reflects God and not for it not to be beautiful. Yeah. And that's where people thought beauty was supplemental. And mm. I said, no, beauty is essential. Mm. Look at creation. I mean, all the flowers could be one color. Yeah. There could only be one aroma. There could only be one flavor. Everything in creation lets you know that beauty is essential. It's not mm. supplemental. Yeah. It's inherent to the nature of God. Mm. Yeah. So then for people listening, how much should they care about their creativity? Not at all and, you know, and everything completely. Great. <laughs> you know, care about stewarding your gifts to mm. serve the world. And I look, when artists are young, they're, all their art is about self-expression. You know, I need to have my voice and speak my truth. Mm. And, and when artists become mature, they actually become a voice for people who are voiceless. Mm. And a song isn't great because it only spoke to the person who wrote it. Mm. A song is great because it speaks for everyone who hears it. Mm. That's when a song, it, when you go, oh, I finally have the words yeah. that I, I didn't know how to say I love you. Mm. But this song finally gives me the words I need and mm. the melody and the emotion. and. And, uh, and over the years, like, you know, when I would be speaking and people would come up to me and say, I've always believed that. I just never had the words to express it. Mm. At first it would frustrate me, go, darn it. They already believed it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they already knew it. Right. And I felt like God was like, no, you understand. Mm. Everything you speak that's actually from me, my spirit's already speaking. Mm. And you're the external confirmation of what my spirit is saying mm. to their soul. Mm. So when they go, you finally gave us a language for it, you need to realize you finally created the art form they needed. Mm. And then what I'd say to people is, don't worry about, quote, if you're creative or not, because you are, mm. you just may not realize it. Because mm -hmm. humans create. It's inherently human to create. Yeah. Every choice you make is a creative act. Mm. And the most spiritual thing you'll ever do is to choose. Mm. So you need to realize that choosing is an act of spirituality mm. and it's a creative act. So look and see just how can you create a more loving world? Mm. How can you create a more compassionate environment? How can you create a world where people have hope? Mm. And so just look at the basic things. Don't think, oh, can I paint? Can I dance? You know, can I finally be an actor? You know, mm. that's a different thing. Mm. 
stop and go, what kind of environment am I creating? Mm. When I enter the room, what have I just created in the room? Mm. And I think that's the most important thing. Mm. And I feel like that's where God just always kind of presses me back because I didn't know I'd be doing this. I thought I was out of this. Mm. I didn't think I'd, I'd be writing books to about faith and anymore. I thought I would never be speaking at events. And mm. I mean, about 10 years ago, I tapped out for five or six years of mm. any public expression of faith, except mm. for Mosaic. Because I wanted another medium. You know, I said, I'm gonna write novels, I'm gonna write science fiction, I'm gonna make films, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna have fashion brands and just do that and design clothes. And and it seemed like I was at least good enough to make it as a career. Mm -hmm. And God just kept, I felt like putting in my heart, look, all that stuff is beautiful and you need to do that, but your primary medium is the human spirit. Mm. And your work of art is gonna be the lives that you see changed. Mm. And I started seeing like the church really is this extraordinary work of art. Mm. And um, when you change a life, you've actually, I mean, think about that, a unique material. Mm. If I use wood or stone or repurpose rubber to material like I used mm. to make bags with, or if you use music or film, you have, you're using temporal material. But when you shape a soul, mm. you're actually using transcendent material mm. as your art form. Mm. And so I hope whatever else I create, mm. that that will be my legacy is that I've created life change as an art form. Yeah, I love that. I feel like I've taken lots of your time. We should probably wrap it up, but maybe we should just finish with this. I want to talk to you about The Way of the Warrior. Oh. Not the book, but the message in the book. Can you share that with our audience, with the guys listening? Because I feel like that's... You mean how the book came to me? Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of ironic because you never write in a book how a book comes to you. No. <laughs> it, it, you know, it's, just, it's just not um, what you do, right? Mm. But my editor called me up and he said, you know, with all the violence and all the outbreaks of wars and, and terrorism, the title, The Way of the Warrior, is really, it's a little bit maybe dangerous. Mm. You know? Could you write an introduction explaining you know, why you chose this title. And I'm like, I asked my son and daughter, they go, yeah, you need to explain why you did it. And really, I always joke about all the voices in my head, but it's really true. I tell my wife, I can't explain it, but like I have places I go in my imagination where I know people in those places as vividly as I feel like I know the people in real life. Mm. And it's a strange feeling because when I go there, it's like I've been there so many times. Mm. And when I leave there, I feel loneliness. Mm. And um, it's probably more than you wanted to know, but so when I'm writing for years, my kids would be afraid for me to drive because I would just, I had literally disappear into mm. an imaginary world. Mm -hmm. And I start writing from a very different place and I'm very method. Yeah. So whatever I'm writing, that is what becomes my reality. Right. And so I write the last era when I have cancer, mm -hmm. you know, I write the artist and soul when I'm designing clothes and making films. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I write Wide Awake when I leave everything and risk to start three companies mm -hmm. at one time and try to make a dream a reality. And I write Soul Cravings because I'm in LA trying to reach an, an unbelieving world mm -hmm. that the gospel doesn't make any sense to them. Mm -hmm. So each book really is a manifestation of my internal journey. And, and so I'm driving down the road on Vine through Hollywood with mm -hmm. my wife. And I just hear this voice and it says, and I changed the language a little bit in the book, but mm. what the voice actually said was, the warrior's not ready for battle until he has come to know peace. Mm. And I changed it to they, or, you know, making right. you know, gender neutral, but, but the voice was speaking to me. Mm. And, then, and then I heard, this is the way of the warrior. Mm. And I leaned over to my wife and I said, I know what my next book is. I know what the first sentence is. And that's how I got the book approved. I sent it to my editor, to my agent, and this is the publisher. And I said, I have a book, it's called The Way of the Warrior, and this is the first line. Do you want the book? Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and I had no idea where the book was going. Mm. I thought it was a different book. Hmm. I, I thought it was going somewhere else. And as I wrote it, it, it surprised me. Mm. And it took a lot out of me. And I felt an immense amount of chaos and tension and even like odd fear. Mm. And 
stress and anxiety. And, and I felt like I was having to go so deep inside of my soul that I didn't even know if I could survive it mm. because I didn't want to write the book observing this struggle. Mm. I wanted to write the book risking stepping back into it. Mm. So the book really cost me a lot. Mm. And when I wrote An Ancient Path to Inner Peace as a subtitle, my publisher was like, we didn't know the book would be so much about Jesus, which I didn't know either. Like, right. I mean, honestly, I don't write a book going, I'm gonna talk about Jesus. Mm. I write a book as an extension of my soul. Mm. And, but I kept going back to, there is really no one who can guide me to this place except for Jesus. Mm. The voices in my head were, uh, I know it's crazy. It's like <laughs> it was a Japanese samurai, right? You know, and I felt like it was Ken Watanabe, you know, and uh, speaking to me. I was like, it sounded like his voice inside of my soul. And a lot of it, I look back. I love the Seven Samurai. I love Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. I love the movie Hero. I even like the Last Samurai. Mm. Although, you know, <laughs> I'm not always a huge Tom Cruise fan, right? But, you know, but Ken Watanabe was phenomenal, and and I've been to Japan many times, and. And Mosaic was really influenced by Japanese culture. When I started Mosaic, I took Japanese simplicity and elegance and the imagination and futuristic perception of Da Vinci. And I took Da Vinci and I thought, okay, if I could take Da Vinci and Samurai culture and blend them together, and that's how I started Mosaic. Okay. And um, as the context from which Jesus would be expressed. Mm. And uh, I know that sounds crazy, but that's just the way I do things. And mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so I wrote the book as an old samurai speaking to a young samurai mm. and leaving behind these principles, these codes mm. uh, to live your life in the way of the warrior. And that you're not, you're a man of, you're, you're not a warrior if you're a person of violence. Mm. And um, it, you're a warrior when you're a person of peace. Mm. But you also understand that sometimes peace has to be fought for. Mm. And you say yeah. something like, we can't know peace in the world till you know peace. That was a soul. huge part of it too. And, you know, even with the terrorist act that has happened today mm. in um, Christchurch, yeah. New Zealand. And, mm. and I, I go, how is it that we can harness nuclear power mm. and figure out how to harness energy and domesticate fire, but we can't create world peace? Mm. And I mean, we can go to the moon, but we can't create world peace. Mm. And what really hit me was that the reason there are wars that rage is because there's a war that's raging within us and mm. we'll never we'll never have world peace until we have inner peace. Mm. And so for me, the book is a attempt to bring world peace one soul at a time. Right. For us, for those listening, it's an example of how to create something mm -hmm. to and have your creativity mean something, if that makes sense. Yeah, so um, hearing you, you talk about the way it came about, the journey of kind of inner struggle and then trying to bring that to the world, I feel like that's what we should be trying to do. So this is a good example of that. So anyways, aside from that, thank you so much for hey, coming. thank you. It's been We've an only honor. scratched the surface and I have heaps more questions. So next time All right. we'll uh, get well, into a much more. For certain. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Hey, thank you so it. much, Rich. All right. God bless you, <laughs>Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Erwin. I really love spending time with him and getting inside his mind. During the interview, we talked about Erwin's latest book, The Way of the Warrior. The message of that book is such a strong message for us as creatives, and I would encourage you to grab that from Amazon or wherever you get your books and um, get, get the message into you, because if we can find inner peace, we can bring that to the world. For more on Erwin, you can check him out on social media. He's got a podcast and, of course, all of his other books. That's it for today's episode. I hope you've enjoyed it and it's been useful for your journey. If you haven't already, I'd love to take a minute just to encourage you to subscribe. When you do that, you become part of our growing community of creatives who are trying their best to live out their faith through their creativity. So join us anywhere you find your podcasts, subscribe, and then you won't miss out on anything. And I always love to hear from you. So please write us a review on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. It helps with the visibility of the podcast and it lets us know what you think, what you're enjoying and where we can go with the podcast in the future. Aside from that, you can write to me on Twitter at Rich Langton and we'll talk to you next time.